So, yeah. So, yeah, the second Rubicon model I've put together. So far, they look really good. I don't see a lot of flash on them or anything. I believe this model kit costs me $14 or $15. And it is a AT gun with five crew. In bolt action, I don't know if a Pac-36 actually had five crew, according to that game. I'm not sure, but this guy's got three loaders, a gunner, and a team leader. I'm not going to use any of them because I am going to use the German Grenadier uh, kit I have in winter jackets and everything and use them to make crew for this thing. So, so we need the gun and then we need the... All right, so E10. What is E10? Okay, no, there it is. We need E18 next. 16, 15. 17, there's a lot of, a lot of things here. So, this is only one sprue, so. Okay, so there's E18. They also sell a Eastern Front and Africa Corps plastic kit of German soldiers on the BMW motorcycles. So let's see. I will be using the full tank shield. So E1617 is right there. So I will grab that. Put the parts on my little cutting board. And I need E12 as well. All right, E12. So it looks like you get enough parts to build this thing deployed or on a vehicle. If, if that ends up being true, then that makes this, uh, this kit a lot better, actually, than I had initially thought it was. The main, uh, my main motivation for buying this is it's in plastic, whereas most bolt action gun sets are metal. And uh, I try to avoid metal when possible. All right. So this is the initial step. Let's see if I can't figure this out. So this piece, All right, let's look here. This piece goes this way. And then this piece goes there. All right. And oh, look at me, unprepared for the test. I don't even have my glue out. All right, so. So yeah, anytime I can get a miniature in plastic as opposed to metal, to me, that's a no-brainer. I will actually tend to avoid a little bit of, I use Tamiya Extra Thin. Now, uh, I used to use a bunch of other kinds of glue, and, and occasionally I will still bust out like the testers if I'm building something really large, but... For these, for something like this, I find the Tamiya, it just works great. So that goes there. Then this piece, I have no idea what this piece is, but it goes here. Okay, I just knocked it apart. So, okay, there we go. Get in there. And then a little glue. And then this piece goes right here. All right. Oh my God. 
These people are on TV are way, way too motivated. But calm down. Calm down. Yeah, I know you're in a competition, but relax. Slow and steady. All right, so that goes right there. Oh, boom. Come on now. I have fat, clumsy fingers. This way. This way. So, there. Yep. Fat, clumsy fingers. My fingers were designed for field work. Construction, throwing ladders. They were not designed for fine detail work. Between the fat, clumsy fingers and the shakes, I would never, ever, ever have made a good surgeon. Matter of fact, it even made it difficult for me on occasion to get a line on patients, but you know, you figure it out. Okie dokie, okily dokily. All right. So that goes right there. So let's look. And it's going to go, it actually goes up. That's wild. So this apparently goes. Let me double check this. It says it goes right there. I'm not looking at this right. And oh, yes. Oh, all right, it goes right there. Okay. So we're going to have to put some glue in there. Get that thing on there. I see somebody is watching, whoever you are. All right. Watching an old guy fumble around with plastic toys and ramble. Okay, let me see. Let's make sure that's right. That is not right. Has to be like. That. Now that is right, but move it up so. Right. Right, 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 right. No. Oh. So. so there's the basic gun. And it's tiny, you know, 20 millimeter, but that's the basic gun, and then we put the shield on. Can you imagine being behind one of these shields, one of these little guns, and hearing rounds ping off of that thing? That would have to be terrifying. You know? I mean, when I was in the Gulf, I was assigned to a Brad unit. And at Red 2, I did hear some small arms fire count kind of plank off the side of the Bradley before we had to dismount, but... You know, you just, I hate to say it, but you trust in your war gear. That's a 40K reference. So this thing fits right there. And look at that. It's going to go on beautifully. Okay. It's about time we got a break. So I'll grab that by the breech and just push that in there. Yeah, cannot wait for the new Space Marine Codex. I've got it on pre-order. I'm excited. Even though 
there's really no 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 uh, new 40k units I, I feel like I need to buy from a space marine army. I mean the go-kart looks kind of badass you know that's a thing well I'm lying there is one thing but the go-kart looks badass not a fan of the gun you know the the Adeptus Mars or whatever mech marine or Mars marine or whatever uh, gun when I think Space Marines, I think, you know, a mobile army dashing all over the place, just using their superhuman strength and whatever to crush the enemies of the Emperor. Uh, what I do not think of is gun teams like that. So that one I won't get. I already know that. Just like I won't be buying the fortification either. Now, I guess if you're playing Imperial Fists or something, that kind of thing might make a lot more sense for your chapter. But if you're playing like Blood Angels or uh, Raven Guard or whatever, then those things make zero sense for your army. I mean, in my opinion. Now, what I am super excited about is the Gladius. I think it's called the Gladius tank. And when they start taking pre-orders on that Joker, I'll definitely be giving my local, oh, excuse me, you know, giving my local awesome store a call and, and telling their game manager to snatch me up two of them. I tend to buy everything in twos or threes. I rarely buy anything um, as a one-off unless it's like, uh, let me think, uh, you know, the Great Uncleaned one or Abaddon, you know, I'm talking Warhammer there. If it's something like that, then of course you only buy one because you could really, well, Abaddon, you can only fill one. I suppose if you wanted to fill two Great Unclean ones, you could. Uh, whoever you're playing against would probably want to punch you in the face. You know, you show up like the bare minimum, cheapest troop choices and whatever you can possibly get, and then a great unclean one. And that army, I don't know, it's probably not very competitive either. I mean, if you're going up against an IG gun line, what are you going to do? Oh, yeah, it does have the steel granite thing. That is awesome. But you're going to, you know, trundle that great unclean one across the board. And you're going up against an IG gun line. They're just going to smoke your ass with the half dozen uh, Lehman Russ tanks that they can bring. So, and in my opinion, you get what you deserve for trying to be such a cheesy git. So, but we'll see. Ninth edition is a whole new edition. I've seen some of the lists people are trying to argue are good for IG. And, and these are people who are a lot better at the game than me, but I just don't like what they're coming up with. I don't like the idea that they're taking tank commanders and PASC and, you know, all that sort of thing. I understand that it's cost effective, but... You know, I do like that IG are back in business as far as infantry, though. I like that. I like the whole showing up to the game with uh, showing up to the game with with fifty dudes in your army. I think that's that's cool. <laughs> you know. I used to play a gunline army a long time ago, an IG gunline army, and uh, believe it or not, well, believe it or not, you have no choice but to believe it or not, I guess, uh, it was Katachin. And I would bring around 100 infantry or so. I mean, it is a huge army. It is a horde army. Um, I didn't bring tanks with my Katachin army. I just brought troops, 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 troops. And in addition to the troops, uh, heavy weapons teams, just troops and heavy weapons teams all over the place. 
And it was a lot of fun to play. My friend uh, who lives in Miami. Yeah, I say it. I'm trying to be more cultural. He, of course, would wreck it because he played a... Um, oh, jeez. The, the Dark Angels that all wear white and ride around in Land Raiders. So I always had a real hard time with that army because... You could just roll up with that Land Raider. Even though I could hit it with a billion LAS cannons, you know, if you don't take it out, then those Terminators get Deathwing. Those Terminators get up on you. If you're IG, it gets bad quick. And that is exactly what happened. Okay, so. So there's the legs. The sports or whatever built. I'm not going to put the wheels on it until it's completely built. And... Okay, and then. All right, these go on here somehow. And how do they go on there? They go on the inside. And it looks like they. So these are the, uh, when you would fold the legs up, I mean, they're tiny pieces, but that would be what you'd put on the hinge, hitch of the truck. This thing comes with them, so I'm going to put them on. And I think I'm doing it right. Yeah, I'm doing it right. So let's grab us some blue. Drop these bad boys in place. Come on now. Come on now. Let's go. How does that? So that, hmm, is that right? Yeah, it looks right. I'm Joe Biden. I forgot what in the hell I was talking about just now. I try not to get super political, but I love that joke. You know, the whole, I'm Joe Biden. Where am I? <laughs> I'm Joe Biden. And I like cream corn. I pretty much hate every election season. You know, they just will not shut the hell up. I just really wish they would. I'm fighting with this thing now. And it goes right there, and I know it goes right there. Boom. Okay, there. It's in there. I'm not messing with it again. Every election season in America, all hell breaks loose, and people who would normally be best friends. Okay, I'm dropping frames. Well, that's the American election season, and I'm sure it's the same way everywhere else where they do allow free elections. You know, the season happens. Every second commercial on television is a political commercial. People who are normally best friends and hang out every day start hating each other's guts for a while.
you know, it's like, see, this election will get over. And my opinion is that uh, no matter who wins or loses, we'll, we'll hopefully just go back to normal. That's my plan. No matter who wins or loses, I will go back to painting some miniatures, hanging out with my friends, you know, playing some 40K, playing some D&D, whatever, you know, like that. Uh, unless somebody comes to my literal house and starts trying to drag me out into the street. Uh, I'm not that kind of guy. So let's hope that doesn't ever happen. Yeah, I had to mess with it and knock it off again. But the reason is, when I was putting the second little hitch on, I realized what I'd done wrong with the first hitch. So, and I could have left alone, but no, I couldn't. And that's just me. So now they're perfect. And that's what I like. Perfection. All right. Now, what else do we need to do? We need the lower shield, which is E27. So, oh, okay, and it's got two kits in case you want to do it when it's being towed versus not. And I want to do it when it's assembled and chucking rounds down range at the, you know, Red Army. One thing that may seem kind of silly, and I think the reason I prefer Eastern Front is because even if I'm playing my U.S. Infantry or U.S. Airborne Army, I just kind of always feel bad if any of them get killed, you know. But when you're playing Eastern Front, uh, Russians versus uh, Germans, you know, I see that's keyed up, so it goes right in there perfectly. Again, oh, I knocked it off. But again, a great, great design choice, Rubicon. Great design choice. I don't know, for those of you out here watching this that have ever built bolt action artillery pieces, especially smaller ones. Jeez, man. Jeez Louise, they can be a real pain in the butt. So then the next thing is some wheels. Some 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 wheels. Some wheels, so let's throw those on, as Stewie would say. Some wheels. And also some cool whip. All right, so the, the wheels are keyed, so they will only fit one. This is like the Keystone Cops building a miniature. Uh, so they'll only fit one way, one your wheel. So uh, yeah, I'm right. This thing comes with enough parts to build one deployed and to also build one to go onto the back of a Humvee or something. Or on the um, Animag or half track. So that actually makes the kit a lot more worth the money, in my opinion. So there is the lower carriage with the supports spread out. And then here's the actual gun with the shield ready. This thing will be mounted on a. Uh, I believe for bolt action, you go ahead and mount these things on a uh, 40. Okay, I was holding that thing upside down, and I was like, what's going on here? Uh, you mount these on a 40 millimeter base, basically, something like that. But let's go ahead and drop a dab of glue in that guide hole, and let's drop her in there.
Now, the thing says not to glue this down, but to hell with that. It's getting glued down. All right, so built. Other than the crew, which like I said, I will be modding the crew uh, so that this will fit in with the Stalingrad or uh, winter theme of the rest of the army. Uh, now that this is done, uh, I think uh, it wasn't hard. I mean, I put together and what? 20 minutes or, or whatever, and that's with running my yap off. And it was relatively cheap for something like this. So I, yeah, can recommend, can recommend. And it'll be super easy to paint too, you know. Primer black, German gray, neutral gray. If you really want a little bit more extreme highlights, highlighted, the, add a little bit of ivory to that neutral gray, light highlight, lighter edge highlight, if that's what you want to do, done. You know, tires, you can do the tires in black, German gray, or another really good look for tires is a German brown. It's a very, very dark brown uh, made by Vallejo um, as part of their model color range. Um, and it actually looks very natural as uh, for tracks, tires, whatever especially if you give it a little bit of a gnome oil or Agrax Earth Shade wash over it. Uh, this guy will end up doing the, like I said, it's going to go black, then gray, and then gray. And then it will probably be punch, paint, sponge painted white. Uh, winter camo. So let's make sure that's on there the way I want it to be on there. And that way it will fit in with the rest of the army when it's on the table. Now, this kit also comes with, like I said, five crew. And the crew are really nice looking. They're well cast. Uh, the only reason I'm not going to use them is they're in summer uniforms. And I want this guy to be winter. And then also it comes with... Um, ammo canisters, some spare ammo and whatever, so you can decorate the base with that. And the last thing it comes with, which I think I'm going to add to this thing, or not the last thing, but is the steel granite round, which is a two-piece kit, a the actual rocket body and then the warhead itself. And uh, so let's look here. There is the warhead and there's the body. They're side by side, so, so that makes it easy, doesn't it? Yes, yes, it makes it easy. So, hey, that almost looks like a, a Panzerfaust warhead. I'm gonna go ahead and leave the rocket body on the sprue because it'd be a lot easier for me to hold this than it would be two tiny little parts. And, uh, Get that in there. I almost had it, and then I shuck it off. So, so I don't know if you can see that, but right there, this bit right there, that's our rocket. And I'm going to give that like two minutes to harden up or so. Actually, I think I can do it now. Let's clip her out. So, uh, all right. So all of this is extra parts. Wow, man. You get enough parts to make a whole, a whole nother gun to mount on a half track if you want. In plastic, that is awesome. Because the metal ones that actually come with the the half track kits again. I mean, I'm, I know it might sound like I'm beating up on Warhammer or Warhammer Warlord games. I'm not trying to. I understand that. I guess it's easier to start out casting metal than plastic. Plastic's a big investment because you have to have a whole mold cast. And, and you also have to determine whether or not you're going to sell enough of these to, to make it cost effective. Whereas to make a mold for metal is is very inexpensive. 
comparatively. I know this because I've worked in a plastic injection plant for about a year when I was younger. And, uh, you know, my job was basically to sit in front of this huge machine and it would slam close, inject it full of molten plastic. And this plant used many kinds of vinyl, you know, polypropylene, polyethylene, um, high fiber, you know, uh, like fiberglass injected plastics and whatever. It was making engine parts and uh, for boat motors. And the thing would shut for like a minute and then it would pop open and a, little pegs would come out and knock the sprue off and it would hit and slide down where I was sitting. If that didn't happen, I was supposed to open the door, which uh, initiated safety lockout, reach in and pry the hot thing. You had to wear, uh, we wore wool gloves to protect our hands because that plastic would be very hot. And as a matter of fact, the mold itself had water running through it to try, I guess, maybe cool it down. I'm not sure. I, I didn't work on things as far as a mechanic, mechanic, but you know, you pull the sprue off, you shut the gate, you hit a button. And most of the time it'll just do that. And then when the sprue come out, my job was to use a clipper and this um, flash trim thing. And you just cut the part out, trim the flash, stack it in a box. And you'd stack a box, like a hundred in a box. And in a night, you know, you could do 10, 20 boxes, whatever, depending on the speed of the thing. So I understand uh, a little bit about how plastic injection molding works. And these are pretty good. Um, this is a small thing, so I don't know. I'm going to guess here. This is me estimating. But it, to get a mold cut with this kind of decent detail, even at this size, is probably a couple thousand dollars at least. And by a couple, I mean closer to 10. Uh, a lot of times they carve them out of, well, depending on what plastic you're going to run through them, determines the, the metal they use. Um, you're, you know, and, and now, of course, they have lasers that can can mill them out. But when I worked in this plant, most of these molds were handmade. They had a whole department of engineers and machinists that would transform a couple of blocks of steel into a functioning mold. Of course, the parts were much more simple than this, too. I mean, you're, you're making like a cowling for a, an air intake, you know, system or something like that. So not not near as detailed with this. So these might be even more expensive to make. So if you're a game company, you have to figure out, you know, do, do you invest all that money on the front end to make one of these and then hope you can sell enough of these to, to actually make a profit? Or do you get a bunch of rubber, basically, and make spin molds? For metal, you know, they just use a really dense, high temperature resistant rubber. It's a two part mold, sits together. You put it in a centrifuge. Um, I also know how this works because my dad was a dental technician. And back in the day before everything changed, he used to actually um, carve out and cast the teeth. And then he would give those to the dentist who would then put the crowns in or whatever. But you get your metal, which he used silver or gold or whatever the customer demanded, but it had to be a noble metal. Otherwise, you, you know, you, it wouldn't work. And um, so you have this big barrel and you put that mold on top of it, that big spinning rubber mold, and you get it up to the spin. And in the middle of the mold is a, a funnel. And the funnel goes down and then out like that. You pour the metal in in the right amount and the centrifugal force pulls that metal into those molds. And then, of course, there's some sheets out. That's where you get your flash and all that. And you let it spin for a minute and then you pop it out and set it aside and put the next mold in. Uh, you could have a stack of 50 of these molds and knock one out a minute. Literally throw them on that thing, click it dump the metal and take it off, set it aside, and then have another guy come up after these things had been given a couple minutes to 
cool down, pop them open, take that whole metal thing, which will come out in a wheel with the miniatures in it, throw them in a bucket or break them loose, throw them in a bucket, whatever, and then you take all that extra material and you just throw it back into the, the cauldron where you're melting the metal. And any miscasts go right back in. So there's almost zero waste when you're doing this. I mean, the metal, you're going to use almost every ounce of metal. And the, the front end, money-wise, is cheap. This is why a lot of your new miniature companies, including Games Workshop, when they very first started, I mean, plastic technology wasn't where it is now, but uh, this is one of the reasons... Um, like a war machine, when they very first come out, they bragged about, you know, being heavy metal and all their miniatures were metal as if that were a good thing. But as soon as they made enough in cells to start cranking out plastic or resin or whatever, that's exactly what they did. And we're seeing that with games or uh, games workshop. We saw over the course of uh, now, I don't think they make a single metal miniature. I can't think of one that's currently in production made out of metal and their resin is garbage. They're fine cast. And I'll tell that to anybody who will listen. Um, Warlord games is still at that phase where they kind of have a lot of metal miniatures and resin miniatures, which I despise, but they're starting to slowly shift over to plastic. And uh, that is, that's a consequence of good cells. When you see your favorite miniature company start coming out with more and more plastic kits, it means they're making money and they're being profitable. If they're not, then it means, you know, whatever. Because a guy like me, if I had the artistic talent to actually make the masters for... Uh, for and I probably could use my 3D printer, honestly, because they do sell um castable resin where you can you can print something in this resin which is kind of waxy make a mold using it cook it off in a cauldron and then spin spin the wind i mean a centrifuge is not centrifuge centrifugal the motor that's not expensive it's an electric motor you know i could build one you know just get an electric motor and make a bracket and on the inside of 55 gallon drum right so that and the molds are pretty cheap i mean the the, the rubber is not expensive you need some brass rods you know for your spacers and you know to make sure it's going to go on the right way um basically what i'm saying is i could do this in my garage with uh, kind of not a whole lot of effort really and then all i would have to do is buy blocks of white metal and uh, set up a way to melt it. And I could, as many molds as I had, I could crank them out and just keep doing it, you know, all day long. This is how your star, your star, this is how your small miniature companies come into existence. You get five or six dudes together, maybe, or one or two. And they might have some talent at carving World War II figures or something like that. They build the, the device I said, I mean, and then they start selling. It really is that way. Uh, there is a company to this day that does that, and it drives me nuts. I don't know why they continue to do it, but it's Iron Wind uh, Miniatures out of Ohio, and they make Battletech figures. And for some reason, they're still making white metal figures. Uh, makes no sense when you can 3D print better looking models for cheaper. Um, if you're the guy that likes to 3D print, I mean, 175 bucks gets you that Elegu Mars. 40 bucks will get you a liter of resin. And a liter of resin, you can crank out probably a battalion of mechs. More if they're smaller, less if they're bigger. I mean, it's all on weight. Um, so... That's a total of investment of like 250 bucks, not counting the alcohol you're going to need. You're going to need a ton of it to rinse these things off when they come out of the printer. You might, if you're hardcore, you might need a UV lamp, but that's not necessary. If you live anywhere where there's decent sunlight, you can throw those things out on the patio for 20 minutes and they'll cure just fine. 
So, um, yeah, that's it. Is what it is. Uh, but Iron Iron Wind, they keep making these metal miniatures. They want to charge you twenty five bucks for a freaking assault mech. Uh, whereas, like I said, I can go into my garage right now. Well, not right now, because I haven't cleaned my machine, and I need to, because I'm being a bad owner. Uh, but I can go out there right now, clean that bad boy up, set it up, and crank four of these out per hour. Actually, per three hours. These are big. Um, the number of miniatures you, put, you, you print doesn't determine how long the print takes it's the height of the build so if you were to print one of these at say a 45 degree angle it will print much faster than one of them standing straight up it's the nature of 3d printing it builds by layers so if you were to take on my build plate i can get four of these guys at a 45 degree angle facing like this and side by side so in about three and a half hours I have four of these, and it cost me about something like three bucks in resin. And these are better looking than the ones Iron Wind Miniatures currently makes. And not by a little bit, by a lot. I mean, these are just much better looking miniatures. These are the new designs. They look all slick and, and high speed. They don't look like 80s robots, you know. I'm, I'm hating on this company, and I shouldn't be. I just, I really wish they would just up their game, you know? Like, if you can make a Space Marine kit that's fully posable with tons of weapon options and everything like that in plastic, there is no reason you couldn't put out, like, say, name a popular Mac in your mind if you can think of one. For me, I'll say, well, this is a thug. But let's say something like a Zeus. It has like 12 variants, depending on the weapons you want to put on it, right? There's no reason you couldn't put out a plastic Zeus kit, which is, you know, clamshell body, glue the legs on, glue the arms on, and then have whether you're going to put different missile kits in the torsos, different weapons, arms, you know, whatever. And you could, you could sell that thing for 20 bucks. And people would buy it. Um... Because, one, it would be fun to build for the builders in us, and it would be fun for the guys that want to, you know, customize their mech. They want to choose where the weapons on this particular mech are. Um, but do these companies do this? Hell no. Hell no, they don't do this. Mech, uh, Battletech, which is one of my favorite war games of all time, I started playing about 85, 86, I guess, somewhere in that area. They have never uh, uh, improved the game in any way. As a matter of fact, and this is a little bit of rant maybe, they have only made the game worse as it goes on by introducing clan tech and experimental tech and all these different things that break the actual rules of the game. Uh, they, they've done themselves no real favors uh, the miniature technology, for the most part, is 20 years behind, you know, something like a Warhammer figure. I mean, I remember when these bad boys come out, something like 20 or 30 in a box. And they were those ugly-ass beakies with, with, you know, they just weren't very good. And now you look at this guy, you know, this is like a seven-piece model, uh, semi-posable. These guys aren't super posable. But just they look amazing. You know, this is a high-end model. This is a model that when I walk into a store and I buy a 10-man a box of these bad boys for 49 bucks, right? I know they're 5 bucks a piece. I don't care. Because they're really cool looking, you know. It's like when you walk into that store and you pick up a Contemptor Dreadnought. He costs you 30, 40 bucks or whatever, but... Then you build that thing, and you're like, he was worth it. This thing is not just a toy. It's a work of art, right? And then you go to, let me show you. I'll show you one, because this is this is how I am. I will show you one. 
Then you buy Ironwind Miniatures Warhammer, which I think just looks goofy as shit. This is their new one. I mean, this thing just doesn't even make any sense. This is my brother, so it's got his Confederate battle banner on. Right? It makes no sense. It's like, what is that? You know, what's going on here? And then you have this guy that I printed out. The new stalker. Now look at that thing. That thing is the beast. That's like an 85 ton assault mech. This thing is a monster. I printed this guy out. It costs $2. Now I do, every time Battletech comes out with a box set, I buy two of them. And the last box set they came out with, I actually bought three. I bought three of the box sets and two of the starter sets. So I do support their company. I do want them to succeed, but it's hard when it feels like, uh, you know, it, it feels like they're not, they're not working with me here. You know, it's like, kind of like that scene from Jerry Maguire where you're like, help me help you, you know, I will give you money if you will make something I want to buy. How hard is this? You know, and, and is if as a company you're not willing to up your game and improve your molds and all that sort of thing, then you need to, to die. That's sad, and I know that's very Anne Rind and 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 uh, free market Darwinism and all that sort of thing. But yeah, it, it, it if you can't up your game with crap I can download from you know online. Uh, and print out in my garage, then you need to die. I'm sorry. And uh, I have a feeling that in about 10 years, Games Workshop won't even make miniatures. I think in about 10 years, when the 3D printing gets really hot, hardcore and inexpensive, uh, Games Workshop will be a studio of miniature designers that just design miniatures and sell the STL files. And that will suck for the brick and mortar stores. Um, unless you would maybe be able to go to a brick and mortar store and buy the STL file for whatever miniature you look like. Imagine if you walked in and there was just like a uh, carousel, like one of those things you see in a CVS with all the cards on it. And one side of the card, you know, had the picture of the miniature that you want to buy. And then the other side of the card maybe had a little, like a tiny little USB drive that had the STL file of that miniature on it. And you go up to the counter and you pay 20 bucks or whatever, and you buy this thing and then you bring it home and snap, you know, click that USB drive into your computer, download the file, set it up on your build plate, print it out. You know, you pay 20 bucks for it. So you're going to print out however many you want. There's no way to stop that um, in my, as far as I know, but the way you would do that and make money is if you're going to do Imperial guards, say each file might equal one or two guardsmen, say different poses or maybe different parts so if you wanted to make a really diverse guard, you know, with guys kneeling and firing or in all kinds of different positions, then you might need to buy five or 10 of these different USBs to get all those different STLs. You, uh, there would, might still be some things you can't do because right now the build plates are nowhere big enough that you could print out, um, you know, like a Bane blade or anything like that. And the resin cost to print out something like that would, you know, probably be pretty pretty extreme. Um, but as far as infantrymen, like if somebody, I'll tell you this right now, if somebody, a professional, were to be able to sit down and make some really super nice looking death core of Krieg infantrymen, uh, they could probably sell those SDLs all day long. Because you're going to pay, what, 70 bucks, $75 for a 10-man squad of these dudes? 
or you're going to print them out. It's going to take you a long time because 3D printing is slow if you want any sort of detail, right? But it's going to cost you literally pennies. Um, so, yeah, there's a mech I printed out. Do I got anything else I printed out that I could show off? I print out, like, a lot of old figures that are no longer made anymore. So, here's one. This is a Hero Quest figure. Let me see if I can get this on the light better, maybe. Okay, that. let's go this way. Is that a little better? Yeah. I paint it up, and he looks really good for the old school GW style. Somebody just converted this over to an STL, and uh, it's free. It's free download. I don't even think these are under any sort of uh, copyright or anything. But this guy costs like 15 cents to make. So these game companies, man, they seriously need to up their game. Or they are going to die. The miniatures companies, the game companies would be just fine. I mean, if somebody made really cool looking World War II soldiers, uh, Bold Action would cry because their whole deal is trying to sell Warlord Games miniatures. But Two Fat Lardies, they don't give a damn because they don't care what miniatures you use. Same with Kings of War by Mantic Games. They have a very large selection of miniatures that you can buy. And uh, they're good. Uh, but they also don't give a damn if you use any other maker's miniatures as long as they're you know, not even in scale. Some people play Kings of War at like 10 millimeter scale, which I think is crazy because at that point you're just looking at little blobs, you know, on, on bases. Um, I like 28 or 20 or 32, which is heroic scale. So... Uh, yeah, but Kings of War, they don't care what miniatures you use. You can show up to a tournament using anything. I rebased my Warhammer figures for my Kings of War army. But I could also, if I really wanted to, um, well, I did, and I'm going to show you. I never painted them, though, so forgive me. Games Workshop stop making these bad boys. These are Chaos Dwarves. And these are, you know, I've got the one I painted here. This is what I want them all to look like eventually. That light is blinding you, I know, but but these are the old school, like third, fourth edition Chaos Dwarves, you know, big hats, uh, just cool looking figures. And uh, you can't get them. No one sells them. Games Workshop doesn't sell them. These are not available. You can buy Infernal Dwarves from Mantic. And they're pretty cool, but they look different than this. They do not have this look. They look more like... They just look like evil dwarves, you know. But they don't have the cool hats or the Babylonian-style beard, you know, the curly beards and all that. Uh, so it's just a style difference, and they're not that expensive. You can buy Man you can buy Mantic Army for dirt cheap compared to like a Warhammer Army. But I printed these guys out. Talk about a week. I printed out about hundred. Um, so right here, you're looking at sixteen of them, which I consider to be a um, not a troop. I think this is a company, and then if I put two together, it becomes a regiment or whatever. Um, however that works. And, of course, I was super hyped, and I made all these, and I based them all up, and got the base code on them, and then got distracted with other things. That is kind of, that's my bane. I talk about it all the time. All right, it's one in the morning, jeez. It is bedtime. It is bedtime for Uncle Chippy. Uncle Constantine needs to sleep so that I can be up tomorrow and be productive. Even though I will be by myself most of tomorrow because the wife is taking the mother out 
and they're having a girls' night, and they're going to go clothes and shoes shopping and maybe grab some lunch and just spend some time together. And my mother, uh, you know, and, and I think that's awesome. So I'm going to putter around the house in my underwear and eat pork rinds or, you know, as some people would call them, chicharron, and build some more models. I still have... I still have an Opal Blitz. I still have a 222. I still have an Italian Fiat Caro Amato 40, uh, uh, what is it, 19 or 1441. Um, I'll be working on some terrain. This glue will be cured tomorrow. And I'll come back and, and, uh, Give it its paint job and throw some texture on it. So I have a lot of projects to do tomorrow to to uh, occupy my time. So let's let's neaten them up a little bit. Make sure everything is closed. Yeah, this is with the still granite, by the way. That makes this bad boy actually a little bit of a threat to a T-34. Anyway, whoever was watching, whoever you are, thank you. Who, uh, you know, and whoever ends up watching this on YouTube, hey, peace and love. I hope you enjoyed my rambling. And, uh, and that's really it. I'll talk to you guys.